apologizing that there's already a lie on my slides. Um, I'm not at Rocky Mountain College, so in an effort to make my future deans happy and get off to a good start, I'll mention that. I'll mention that I'm at Bloomsburg University in Pennsylvania. And but for the, for the time being, I'm very happy to be here in Seattle with all of you. And I'd like to thank the organizer and all of our sponsors as well. So everything I'm going to talk about about this interesting number is joint work with Michael Fulisetta from South Carolina. And I should obviously talk about why this number is so interesting. And maybe before I do that, let me, let me say something about why it's not so interesting. So there's nothing that quite that special about this 32-digit long number. I can easily substitute it in the title, this, this other 32-digit long number. Um, or maybe even less aesthetically pleasing, 1.69 times 10 to the 34th. And uh, I don't have the number of my title memorized because there's, I could keep doing this for the next 30 minutes and put flash up interesting numbers. Um, interesting along the same lines. Okay, so uh, here's here's a book next that some of you might be familiar with. And uh, right about now, I, I usually insert a joke um, about Michael Filosetta that he's getting a little bit old now, so he might remember this when it first came out in German in the early 1900s. But uh, since I'm on camera, I'll refrain from those <laughs> jokes. <laughs> Okay, so uh, yeah, so here's a, here's a quite famous book. Does, it, does anybody here know the German title? I'm not going to mispronounce it. Make fool myself, so I ask. No. Okay. Somebody with your computer. Open. So in here's problem 128. 128. So uh, it says that if you start with prime and you write out its digits, uh, so you can write it as a polynomial in ten. If you replace the tens with x's, then you get in your useful polynomial. Or so this. This claims. So, uh, as a way of an example, um, there's this guy, Tommy Two Tone, that had a girlfriend named Jenny, and she had a really nice prime that she really liked, 8675309. And uh, since this is a prime, you know, she's pleased that she gets an irreducible polynomial out of it. Um, it so happens that Jenny has a, has a twin, uh, a bit of a jealous twin. She has a favorite prime, and she's equally pleased that she gets polynomial and I get some blank looks so uh, maybe I'll say that, that Tommy Two-Tone was a famous artist and his girlfriend Jenny appeared as the title of the famous song. I don't think she was his girlfriend. <laughs> okay. Still some other blank stares so uh, I should mention this isn't a CD it's called a vinyl record. <laughs> okay. So Michael first saw this problem when he was um, an undergraduate in the early 70s, uh, another age joke goes there coming from. And uh, so this is called Cohen's Criterion, and there's lots of famous cones floating around in mathematics. So uh, this is one of them in the singular there, and that probably still doesn't help. So uh, I'll say it's Arthur Cohen, who was a student of I. Schur's in the early 1900s. And that, that's all I know about Arthur. So like I said, Michael first saw this problem in the early 70s. And we want to think about generalizations of this. And that's what I want to talk about today. The first progress came in 1981. Uh, there's nothing special about base 10. Right? So Cohen's criterion extends to, to any base b. So if you start with a collection of base b digits that happen to be a prime in base b, and you concatenate those digits into a polynomial, it has to be irreducible. So for example, here's Jenny's prime again, uh, written now in base 9, and the polynomial is irreducible. Okay. So another generalization. So here I've restated Cohen's criterion a little bit. Uh, so if a polynomial has non-negative integer coefficients, that's the setting that we're always going to be in, non-negative coefficients. And they're each less than or equal to 9, so they're base 10 digits. If f of x is such that f of 10 is a prime, then f of x is irreducible. So the first question, maybe, in the way of generalization is, is there anything special about digits? So I've already said that there's nothing special about base 10 digits. Well, what about any digits in general? So namely, can I replace something, I replace that question mark with something other than that? So uh, before I move on with that, uh, here's a very simple lemma in the way of an observation. 
So suppose we're in this setting, f of x is non negative integer coefficients, f of n is a prime. If f of x has no roots in this region in the complex plane, this is the unit circle center to 10, so there it is. Unit circle center to 10. No roots in that region, then f of x is irreducible. And this is such a simple observation that I can, I can fit the proof uh, in a little bit of space that I have left. So here it goes. So uh, if our polynomial is reducible, then I have a factorization of a prime p. Right? So one of these factors has to evaluate to 1. Uh, suppose it's g. Well, I can factor g according to its roots. Right? And if all of the roots lie outside of this region, right, then I'll find it really hard to multiply it to 1. Let's make it function. Okay. So this leads us to a simple argument, very simple argument. So if I have a root in this region, then what's, the, what's its maximum argument? Well, let's see, there it is. And this is arc sine of a tenth, right? This is the unit circle center of a tenth. Arc sine of a tenth. And uh, so here's a proof of a nice theorem um, with a picture. And I, I sent an email with this picture to, to the proof without words people. And I got a very uh, kind rejection from them. Uh, it didn't quite make the cut. So here's, here's my proof without words. Can anybody figure it out? So if I have if I have this root alpha inside the unit circle center to 10, and I raise it to powers, what's the argument of alpha to the n going to be? It's just going to be the right, multiples of theta. So this tells me that the little calculation here tells me that the imaginary part of alpha to k is greater than zero whenever k is between one and three. Right? So what theorem do we get out of that? Well, if I have a polynomial with non-negative integer coefficients. The degrees bounded above by 31, and f of 10 is a prime that has to be irreducible, right? It's hard to be a root if the imaginary part is positive. So there's the proof of that word. So back to our question, is there anything special about digits? Anything special about digits? Maybe I should mention here that that very simple argument there uh, is the basis of all of, all of the results along this line. It's just uh, a further complexification of that simple argument. So uh, here's another example, polynomial. And this one maybe you can't just stare at and realize what's going on. So let me, let me calculate for you here. So there's the polynomial. And uh, is it prime at 10? Well, yes, it is prime at 10. And let's see, is it irreducible? Well, no, it has the factor of x squared minus 20x plus 101. So what does this example tell us then right, about what we can put here in place of the question? Well, we obviously can't put this big number here in place of the question mark, right? Because we have an example of, an irredu or of a reducible polynomial that evaluates to a prime of 10. So we cannot place the question mark with about 6.12 times 10 to the 31st. OK, what can we do? What can we do there? So the next progress in this, in this type of generalization came in 1988. Michael showed that, that you can replace that question mark with 10 to the 30th, quite a big So, next obvious question, right? Can we put anything bigger? Anything bigger? Anybody want to make a conjecture? Maybe? No? The obvious? Okay, so let, let's, let's see if 10 denote the largest integer that we can put there. And here's, here's the next progress that came in 1987, 1993. These are both students of Michael's. And, uh, and here's some lower bounds and upper bounds for what C of B is for, for base B. So I'm talking about base 10 here today. So uh, here's what was known um, to date, until recently, about c of 10. So it's bigger than 2.52 times 10 to the 30th and, and less than or equal to 4.96 times 10 to the 31st. And if you stared long enough at the number in the title, it's about 4.95 times 10 to the 31st, right? So uh, both Alexander and Angle did, did sort of the same thing independently. Um, Alexander found some lower bounds all the way up through base 10 and some upper bounds, and then Angle came along and improved the lower bounds and did upper bounds, but he did everything, uh, the same upper bounds. Um, he didn't do anything new there, all the way up through base 20. And you can keep going if I had more room I could put hundreds of these up here. But it's quite a simple calculation. Uh, so let me mention something real quick about where these upper bounds come from. Right? The upper bounds come from examples like the one that I showed you, of a reducible polynomial that evaluates to a prime of 10. Right? So you construct one of these, 
right? which isn't really that difficult if you tell you really quick how to do that. So you start with the g of x such that g of 10 is equal to 1. You construct some other half of it, let's say g squiggle, right? such that the product has non-negative integer coefficients. That's fairly easy to do. Uh, now, when you plug in 10, you don't necessarily get a prime, right? but you can find out where the next prime above it is, like this. And if I do this and factor out g of x, now I have a prime that evaluates, or a, a polynomial that evaluates to a prime of 10 that's reducible, right, as a factor of g of x. So you construct examples like this and look at what the largest coefficient is, right? And then you know that c of whatever has to be at least that big. It has to be smaller than that. Okay, so fairly straightforward. Okay, so here's, here's a more interesting example. And I'll let you stare at this one for a little bit. And while you do that, I'll explain that this notation here, dot, 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 means that uh, every term in this polynomial is accounted for between x to the 30th all the way down to x to the 5th, and all the coefficients are the same exact and the same thing for this one right here. So you might notice that uh, that coefficient right there is the title of, of my talk. And another interesting fact is that let's see, this one right here is exactly plus one more than the title of my talk. And if you're really quick, some of you were factoring my number uh, during the break. If you're really quick, you'll see that f of 10 is prime. And maybe let me convince you of that. So here's what f of 10 actually is, and it happens to be prime. And uh, I'll save the calculation for you, for you. But uh, it's divisible by x squared minus 20x plus 100. So what does this mean? Well, you know, in our extension of Cohen's criterion, we, we can't replace 10 to the 30th by this number. Right? But what can we replace it by? OK. So a more interesting theorem, uh, and this is December of 2012, is that c of 10 is this number that's in the title of my talk. So another question I always get is, is, is did we get this by some big agglomeration of computer calculations? Right? And big random numbers like this usually pop up in such ways from an extensive computer search. Uh, so, uh, but I'll, yeah, I'll touch on that a little bit later. So, here it is stated in a different way, uh, more in terms of the way I say the Cohen's criterion. So have a polynomial, non-negative integer coefficients, that evaluates to a prime of 10, and all the coefficients are less than or equal to this number of my talk, in the title of talk, then the polynomial is irreducible. Right? And moreover, this is the largest integer for which this works. So that's the main result. And why isn't this number that interesting then? Uh, well. Sorry, long plane right. If instead all the coefficients are less than or equal to this the number that was in the, the second proposed title of the talk, and the polynomial is reducible, then it has to be divisible by x squared minus 20x plus 101. And moreover, this is the largest integer with that one. So what happens if the coefficients are a little bit bigger? Well, if instead I replace that number with 1.169 times 10 to the 34th, that other proposed title, and the polynomial is reducible, then I just add another polynomial to the list, x squared minus 19x plus 91. Does anybody recognize anything interesting about those two polynomials, other than the fact that they evaluate to 1 and 10? They produce many primes. What's that? They produce many primes. Do they? Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, so we'll put that thought on hold. We'll come back to it. Right? So uh, here's the statement of the main theorem again. Mm -hmm. So where does the number come from? The difference of those two was x minus 10, wasn't it? Was it? I don't know. I've never, I've never done the arithmetic. Yeah. Are you sure? Can we do it again? Is it the second one minus the first one? Maybe. I can I don't think it matters. Yeah. <laughs> That's not the interesting part. But so where does it come from? Where does the number come from? Okay. So uh, here's my claim uh, that this big number is not the result of an agglomeration of calculations. So let me let me 
talk in that direction for a little bit. Okay, so, so that's what we want to do. So uh, I wanted to find a recursion like this. So I start off with, with b sub 0 being 1, then b sub 1 is 20, and then I look at the remaining terms, just like just a standard uh, linear recurrence. And so what, here's some of the terms of this sequence. So here's up through beta 15, and here's all the way up through beta 32. And hmm, what does this have to do with anything? So does our number appear anywhere in that list? Uh, which one? Close, close, right? Um, yeah. Does anybody see that it's not 26? Close, the first, the first two digits are, are there, but R is 495, so it's way off. <laughs> way off. Okay, so yeah, so what does this have to do with anything? Well, uh, so beta J increases all the way up through beta 30, right? Nothing special yet about beta 30, it's still nowhere close to the number in our title. Um, but what you will notice is that uh, beta 30 times 82 is the number in the title of the talk. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so what's so special about our number? Well, maybe we should start asking what's so special about 82. Right. So put that in your back pocket as well. All right, so where does 82 come from? That's the next question. So here's the recursion again. And the characteristic polynomial of this recursion, anybody want to take a guess? Maybe I should, should have minus four minus one hundred. Yeah, there you go. Good guess. How'd you guess, right? So maybe I should have changed the title of my talk to, to a tease, right? Okay. So yes, the characteristic polynomial of the recursion is x squared minus twenty x plus one hundred one. So what does this have to do with proving that our number is, is c of ten? Well, let's go back to how I said that, that Alexander constructed these upper bounds, right? Uh, start with a polynomial that evaluates to 1 of 10, like x squared minus 20x plus 101. Construct the other half and shift it to a prime. Okay. So if f of 10 is prime, yet the polynomial is reducible, uh, then it has a factor with g of 10 equals 1, right? So one, of, one such of these g of x's is x squared minus 20x plus 101. And the key fact here is that if we consider the class of all reducible polynomials with this property, right, non-negative integer coefficients that evaluate to prime of 10, right, and we choose f of x so that its largest coefficient is as small as possible. So that's the one that we're interested in, right? Okay. Then this f of x has to be divisible by x squared minus 20x plus 100. So that's why that polynomial is so special. Okay. So let's see. So there's the key fact. So with this in mind, let's start with x squared minus 20x plus 101. And let's try to construct this other half so that the coefficients are as small as possible when I pick these uh, b's, the coefficients of b. So I want to choose the b's of j, b integers, so that the product will have non-negative integer coefficients, the largest one as small as possible. So what do these, these b's look like? Well, b0 has to be greater than or equal to 1 for this to work, right? Remember, I want non-negative integer coefficients when I multiply it out. b1 had better be bigger than or equal to 20 times b sub 0. Right? And if I go on through the rest of them, um, right, the bj's in general have to be greater than or equal to 20, b sub j minus 1 minus 101, b sub j minus 2. Does that look familiar? Mm -hmm. yeah. A little bit? Okay. So, uh, they didn't I think that's what's next. Yes. So there was our original recursion. Right. So remember, b sub, what was it, 30? Right? Was 82 times the number in the title? So the question is, right, if the bj's follow this recursion, those recursive inequalities, and the beta j's follow the analogous recursion, right, how can we relate the two? So is it true that these b sub j's have to be greater than or equal to beta sub j for all j, right? That might point us in the right direction. Well, if I had a list here, uh, I'm not going to put it up, uh, you can see that it's false. It's not true. Right? The first couple fail. Uh, so no, it's not true. So that doesn't tell us anything. But what is true is that if the beta j increase up to some point, call it capital J, then from then on, the beta j's are a lower bound for the bj's. Okay. So, okay. 
stuff out of the way. So in particular, B to sub 30 is greater than or equal to beta sub 30. So that 82 times B sub 30 is greater than or equal to this number in the title of my talk. So where does the 82 come from? Anybody want to take a, a guess at that now? No guesses? So here's a hint. Evaluate at one. What's that? Evaluate at one. Right, the sum of the coefficients, right? Mm -hmm. Or this polynomial evaluate. The sum of the coefficients is, is 82. Right? Okay, so that's where the 82 comes from. 82 is the sum of the coefficients of x squared minus 20x plus 101. Okay, so back to the key fact, and you'll notice that, I think that's next. So, uh, yeah, so here's the lemma. So if I have a polynomial that's divisible by x squared minus 20x plus 101, who cares what it evaluates to a 10, right? It has to have a coefficient greater than or equal to, or strictly bigger than the number in the title, or greater than or equal to plus 1. Okay? So, yeah, so I, I haven't told you anything, but I did keep my promise, I hope. And that was that if, I haven't tried to convince you that this is the right bound, this number in the title of the talk. But I, I, what I set out to do in the beginning, if you remember, is give you some explanation as to why this number is not the result of an extension that extends a computer search, right? There's some analysis that's going on there where we get it from. Okay. So here's our main theorem again. And I think now I want to comment um, that, that this exact value for C of 10 uh, comes in two different steps, right? So the first step, um, is to show that, that any reducible polynomial uh, of this type has to have a coefficient that's at least this big, right? And the second step is to show that uh, if f of x has coefficients less than or equal to this number, then it has to be irreducible, right? So the original motivation for this came uh, from this bound of, of Alexander, the 4.96 times 10 to the 31, right? So my original thought was that if I can construct a better polynomial, I could get a better bound and I can sort of narrow the range down that way. So that's what I started to do. And so I was able to prove that um, if I have a polynomial, right, a reducible polynomial, all the coefficients less than or equal to Alexander's original bound, upper bound, then it had to have x squared minus 20x plus 101 as a factor. And that's as far as I got in my dissertation. And uh, about, uh, so about two hours, two and a half hours before my defense, I was having lunch with Michael and uh, and by the time coffee and pie rolled around, um, we had convinced ourselves that we knew how to actually calculate this number, right? So uh, I had about an hour to hurriedly go back to my office and rewrite half of my slides so that I could announce the result, right? Everything after, we don't yet know that, got tossed out so we could announce the result. Um, but yeah, so that, that's sort of the development of this. So there's two parts to it. The first part showing that uh, if the coefficients are small, right, smaller than what was known previously, it has to have x squared minus 20x plus 101 as a factor. And if it does, well, then it has to have coefficients at least this big. And that's how we calculated that, that big polynomial. Okay. So I want to talk about the, the second part, right? So why is it that if all the coefficients are less than or equal to the number in the title, then the polynomial is reducible? So yeah, so what can we say about the g of x with g of 10 equal 1? Well, it has to have a root in this range. That was the simple observation, right? And here's, here's another calculation. Another proof without words. Anybody tell me what this one says? So uh, what are the, the arguments of powers of alpha up through 15? It says that they're less than a right angle as long as alpha and k is less than or k is less than or equal to 15. Right? So uh, if the degree is less than or equal to 15, then the polynomial is irreducible. So you can get the bound 10 to the 15th like this. Michael did a little bit more tricks in that 1988 paper in 10 to the 30th by looking at what happens on the other side of the complex plane as well. A little more complicated there. So uh, here's a simple argument along those lines. So if I have an alpha in this range, uh, inside the unit circle centered at 10, right, 
and I divide out my alpha to the n. So all I'm doing is just taking the exponents of alpha to the n and putting them in the denominator. Is all. And I use the triangle inequality uh, and the fact that the a and the, the coefficients are all integers. Right? I get something like this. And if I assume the coefficients are smaller than, than uh, what I said they were, then yeah, I can extend this to an infinite geometric series and, and get a lower bound here. Right? So let's see. Uh, the modulus of these complex numbers, since, since alpha is in the unit circle center to 10, this is at least 9, right? So uh, I get that the largest coefficient has to be bigger than 9 to the 15 times 8. So that's not quite big enough, right? Not quite big enough than what I said would be there, right? So can we do bigger? Well, so here's, here's the real moving parts of it. This appeared in Alexander's dissertation, 1987. So if I have uh, a root um, in the upper half plane with positive real part, that's what that says there, right? Then it has a coefficient bigger than b times the leading coefficient, where b is, is the maximum taken over all integers k. So what you'll notice, uh, if you know anything about cotangent, which my students usually don't, <laughs> is that if theta gets really small, right? The smaller theta is, the bigger this number b is. Right? The bigger this number b is. Okay. All right. So uh, yes, so in particular, here's the unit circle center to 10. Right? So the smaller theta is, the larger one can take k. And I have to remember what's coming next after I click here. Right. Ah. This is supposed to relate to the key fact somehow. Right. So why might this be true? So it has to have a root, I already said that. So uh, if instead of looking at the unit circle centered at, at 10, I'm going to shift it to the unit circle centered at 0 just for simplification. Right? We have to have root in this region. But we can say even more. Right? So a polynomial with g of 0 equals to 1, or the analogous g of 10 is equal to 1, if I want to just shift this to the right by 10, has to have a root in, in a very special region that I'm going to call script r, and I'll overlay it. So here's, here's script R. Okay. And script R includes these three points up here. Okay. Did anybody see where x squared minus 20x plus 101 comes from yet? So uh, here's the two polynomials that I've already mentioned. Right? And if I allow even larger coefficients, I'll, I'll pick up this one even. And uh, why are these so special? Well, they're shifted cyclotomics. Okay? So you'll notice that this region is, is a little bit better for this purpose and the types of arguments that I've already given you, uh, in that here was the original largest argument of a root in the region. Okay? If I can show, and we can, that there has to be a root in this better region, right? the argument's a little bit small. Okay? So we get a better bound that way. So, so, for example, back in, in Alexander's lemma here, uh, I can take theta to be pi over 36 and k greater than or equal to 36 uh, if I know that there's a root in this region. Okay. So if I assume for the moment that, that uh, my polynomial is not divisible by one of those three up above, in particular x squared minus 20x plus 101, right? um, and I can show that it has to have a, region, have a root in this new region that's shaded here, right? I can get an even bigger bound. Okay, so where does the region come from? Next. All right, so, uh, well, let's start by talking about the curve here. What curve is this? So, I want to take z that's in this region, and I want to write it in terms of its real and imaginary parts, x plus i, y. I'm going to be going back and forth here between uh, r2 and the complex plane, uh, just whatever suits my purpose. So, I want to consider the function uh, f, of x, y, um, f per fraction here, I think. Uh, numerator and denominator, hopefully the notation is obvious. Right? So I want the denominator to be 10 minus z to the 40th power. And the numerator is, let's see, 10 plus a to 6 minus z to the 6. And I have the conjugate there, and I want to add on some more stuff, z to 3. And I'm not done yet, I want to add on powers of 10 plus i in there as well. And I want to think of this as being a function of the real and imaginary parts of z. So in particular, 
the numerator and the denominator are all in z adjoint x, y. Right? The imaginary parts go away. And uh, so you can either throw this into Mabel and have Mabel or Sage or whatever show you that, that these are integers, or you can think that uh, this product here is symmetric in, in 10 plus a is 6, 10 plus a is 6 conjugate, so on and so forth. Uh, so this has to, this product has to value to an integer. Okay. So in particular, if I think of g of x as being a product of its roots in time substituting coefficient, right? Then when I take the product of the numerators, evaluated all the roots, right, of g, right, I'm going to get g of 10 plus a of 6, g of 10 plus a of 6 conjugate, and um, the rest of them, right? Okay. And these are all integers. Well, okay, so I think I was wrong there. Uh, I forgot the leading coefficient here, right? So all those stack up, and I get e to the 36th power. All right, so what about the denominator? Well, the denominator is just 10 minus z to the 40th power. So if I take this with the product over all of the roots, right, I'm going to get g of 10 to the 40th, but g of 10 is 1, right? So when I put this together, what does it tell us? So, yeah, so that's what I get. What's this in the numerator? I mean, I know it's ugly. My eyeballs are about to bleed if I look at it any longer. It's an integer, right? Okay. So 1 divided by b to the 8 uh, times the product of this function f evaluated at the roots, it's an integer. So in particular, b to the 8 is smaller than, than this product. All right. So some root of g of x must be in this region. So let me convince you of that, hopefully. So what is the region? Well, here's the denominator again, and here's the numerator. And I want to think of a polynomial p. That's just the difference of the denominator minus the numerator. So uh, you'll observe that it's even in both x and y, and has degree 40 in x and 40 in y. It has an integer coefficient. So we've already said this one, and maybe these three aren't immediately observable. So uh, I'm going to put it up here, but in order to make sure I can fit it all on one slide, uh, since it's even in both x and y, I want to knock the powers down by a half, and to make the coefficients a little smaller, I'm going to shift it by 10. Okay? So I can write it in the form of a polynomial in y with coefficients in z adjoint x. Right? And what do the coefficients look like? Well, here they are. Um, and yes, they all have integers. And uh, I always hate to waste space in my slides. So maybe in the way of a little intermission, my uh, kids, ever eager to be exploited, volunteered to fill the spot. <laughs> OK. So right. So. What this region R is, or the defining curve, is, is the real locus of P of x, y. So if I think of this as fixing an x on the x-axis, right, and looking at the largest root, the largest real root, y, right, I get this picture. This is the first picture of this region that I really drew. And as you can see, um, I had to just plot points and put them together so that it looked somewhat continuous. Uh, well, it turns out that this curve is actually continuously differentiable. And uh, that's actually, that was actually quite involved to prove. So again, I'm fixing an x and taking uh, and, and picking the, root, the largest real root y of p of x y. And the technique here is actually pretty simple. So there's nothing more than some Descartes rule signs and a little bit of Sturm sequences thrown in there. So it's not too complicated. Just put together in a clever way, I guess. But uh, right, p of x y was the difference of the denominator of the numerator. So yeah, so if the denominator is bigger than the numerator, right, then f of x, y is going to be less than 1, right? And if the denominator is smaller than the numerator, that's where it's negative, right? It's going to be bigger than 1, right? Well, f of x, y has to be what? An integer, right? That was the big idea. So it would better be bigger than 1, so it has to have it inside this region. All right. Good. So here's... Here's the main result again. And uh, again, these other two numbers here were gotten in the same sort of fashion, right? Uh, using the same region and uh, saying what happens if the other guy up on the list is a root. Right. So some open problems connected to this. Uh, so does this continue to happen? What is this? This is, well, if I keep adding a larger and larger 
number, a larger bound on the coefficients, right? Do I just keep adding more polynomials to the list? So, yes, namely, given some bound n on the coefficients, does there exist a finite set of polynomials such that if f of x has non-negative integer coefficients bounded above by n, f of 10 is a prime, and f of x is reducible, then f of x has to be divisible by, by some element of t. So, um, yeah, at this fateful lunch right before my defense, uh, when I got up to get coffee, I came back with reasons for Michael, uh, maybe, maybe. And uh, by the time he went back for his dessert, he had pretty good reasons to say maybe not. And by the end of lunch, we both agreed that there was evidence that we could say who knows. So this one is, this one is wide open. Right? So uh, I gave you a result that bounded the degree, right? Where uh, the, the simple argument, if you remember from the beginning, uh, no bound on the coefficients was necessary. Right? So in particular, here's the theorem that we proved. If, the degree of f is less than or equal to 31, then f of x is irreducible. That's the one that I drew. Right? Well, what happens? Well, if I bump up the bound on the degree to 34, right, uh, I get an analogous result. It has to be divisible by x squared minus 20 x plus 101. Right? And uh, if I bump it up even further, well, I add one more polynomial to the list, right? the obvious choice. And uh, so in general, can I keep doing this? Well, we're, we're, we're pretty sure yes, right? So if I uh, bound the degree by some d, right, there should be a finite set of polynomials, right, uh, such that this happens, right? Such that a factor has to be for that finite set. Uh, so the, the open question, I guess, is what are the details? We're trying to write that up now. So let's see, the last thing is, if you remember, Cohen's criteria didn't matter about the base, right? So should we be able to calculate these numbers for any base? Well, yes, we should. You'd think so, right? Uh, so to what extent can we generalize uh, the method to get the other bases? Right? So what happens if I take that, that fancy region I showed you and I start pushing it out? So it's centered not at 10, but 11 or 12, right? The argument of a root in that region gets smaller, right? And that's a good thing in terms of Alexander's lemma, right? It blows up the bound. So uh, bases larger than 10 should be, should be doable. Right? And in fact, uh, current students of Michael's right now, um, Scott Dunn and Morgan Cole, are actually working on this. And, uh, and I got an email a couple weeks ago uh, that they've actually calculated the numbers for, for b less than or equal to 13. Right? And um, there was some sort of hiccup in our method at, at b equals 14 um, that I haven't asked about yet. So yeah, so we expect this to be doable um, for bases greater than or equal to 10. Fairly straightforward. Right? Not as straightforward for bases three through nine, right? That argument's getting bigger if I take some similar region, right? Or if I construct a similar polynomial and shift the region towards the origin, the argument's getting even bigger, right? Especially, especially for base two, right? The unit circle center to two is, is tangent to the imaginary axis, right? That's a bad thing, right? So, uh, so it's not gonna be as straightforward, but we should be able to do it, and, and base two is, is what's really interesting, right? Something completely new would have to be invented for base two. So uh, there's a multitude of other questions that one can ask along these lines. Right? And uh, if I finish at the right time, almost, uh, I don't have time for it. So thank you. Questions for Sam? What about polynomials with negative positions? What about them? <laughs> But what positive and negative mix something. Right. So in terms of yeah, is in it terms of to do anything about that. Um, yeah, I don't know. We only looked at non-negative zero coefficients, but only because we were trying to generalize Cohen's criteria. Right. So yeah. So that's that's a good question. Um, I do know that. So uh, so the whole key was what, what can you say about polynomials that, such that g of ten is equal to one, right? Um, so in, in um, our paper that we recently submitted on this, there's a reference. Uh, it's a private correspondence with Dobrowolski. So private that I didn't get to see it. <laughs> but uh, he, claimed, uh, he claims to have an argument that, that uh, not only do we have to have a root in that region, but we also have to have a root with, uh, with real part bigger than 9.5, right? So slightly to the right inside that region. So if I can draw it. There it is. So yeah, so if g of 10 is 1, 
right? Then, uh, then f of x has to have a root. Um, so here is 9 plus 0.5 meters to the right. Right? Not necessarily the same one that's in this region. So, yeah. But it's a very interesting question, right? If, if g of 10 is 1, what can you say about the roots? Right? Or a root of g of x. Yeah. Yes? Okay, let's thank Sam again. <laughs>